So the good news is I don't have any more logic to teach you. I taught all, you the, all of the logic I was going to teach you, I have already taught you. All we're going to do today is talk about the basic structure of the exam. I'm going to show you what every question you're going to see looks like. I'm not going to show you the questions, obviously, but I'm going to show you the, what the basic format's going to be, and then we'll just like look at one example, and that'll be it. There's very little to do today, actually. So uh, unless there's any questions about stuff. So feel free to, at any point during this, ask questions about like if you're not clear on what you're seeing or whatever. But hopefully, it should be fairly straightforward. So here is the structure of the exam, the overall structure of the exam. There's going to be 64 points in total. 26 of those are symbolizations, 14 invalidities and expansions, and 24 derivations. So we'll go through these each and show you exactly what you're going to see. Yeah? OK, so just like before, just like on test one and test two, you'll see the following prompt, symbolizations. Symbolize the following sentences using the symbolization scheme provided. And what you're going to see is something like this. So question one, every boy gave a treat to some dog he liked. And the scheme is going to look like the following. So there was some confusion about this on test two, where we so. I just want to get really clear on what exactly this is asking you to, is saying. So uh, B1, the one just indicates that it's a one place predicate. And the A says, whatever we're plugging in for the variable here, it's a boy. Yeah? We did, we, I, I yelled this out in test two, but I would, like to talk, I would like to talk it through in a more controlled fashion before we do the exam. Uh, do you want to, I mean, do you want to do this example? Yeah? OK, let's do this example, and then we'll be very clear on exactly what this is saying, and there'll be no confusion. Yeah? OK, so um, I haven't actually, so I have a few examples we can work through. I have not actually solved these examples, so we're doing this live. We're doing this live. I might need your help. Um, OK, so every boy gave a treat to some dog he liked. OK, so. We're going to think through the structure of the sentence. Every boy gave a treat to some dog he liked. So probably going to be a universal of some type. Uh, I mean, I typically work backwards from the most complicated connectives. Uh, so G3 is complicated. It's a three-place predicate. And L2 is a two-place predicate. So we're going to decide beforehand what's going to go into G and L. So before we even start symbolizing this thing, G is going to be something, something, something. So A gave B to C. A boy is going to give a treat to a dog. So let's call it X, Y, Z. And just make a note for myself that X is going to be a boy, Y is going to be a treat, and Z is going to be a dog. Yeah? OK. And then the other one that's going to be slightly complicated is L. A liked B. So who liked who here? The boy liked the dog. Yeah? So the boy, L, X, Z, is going to be our two-place predicate. Yeah? OK, so this is just by way of figuring out which variables I'm going to assign to which parts of the big complicated predicates. And then we're going to use those parts to build up the rest of the sentence. So. What do you think the major operator of this sentence is? Is it a conjunction, a disjunction, universal, existential? What is this thing? It's a universal. I would say it's probably universal. The every is the giveaway. So for all some things, we said for every boy, and we said x is our boy. So for all x, something, something, something. Uh, if b1, so if x is a boy, then something. Every boy gave a treat to a, some dog he likes. OK, now what? You say there exists some dog that the boy gave a treat to. So one of the ways of doing this is to rephrase the sentence in a more logic-y sort of way. So how could we rephrase this to be more like if you're trying to make your writing worse? This is an excellent training to make you a worse writer. Less flow and less intuitive. Every boy, for all boys, there exists some dog that that boy gave a treat to and that the boy liked the dog. Does that sound like a good translation of that to you? 
Okay, good. <laughs> good. I'm glad you liked it. I'm glad you liked it. I worked hard on it. I just came up with it. Okay, so, um, so every boy gave a treat to some dog that he liked. So there exists some dog, which is our Z. So there exists some Z such that uh, DZ, so Z is a dog, and we're going to have to say that there's a treat as well. So we need another existential here. So we say there exists some Y such that Y is a treat, and uh, so if something is a boy, for all the boys, there's some dog and there's some treat such that I suppose that, hmm, so he gave a treat to some dog that he liked. So there's some dog, and maybe we should say, and the boy liked him before we say that there exists a treat. No, we can, we can put it in here. So, and L X Z. So the boy liked the dog, and the boy gave a treat to the dog. And we just give ourselves enough brackets to close this thing off. Bracket, bracket, bracket. OK, I'm, I'm, I'm literally, I did not do this ahead of time. I'm literally doing this off the top of my head. So somebody tell me if this is right or not. Seems right. Seems right. Thing, yeah. Yes, it should be x, y, z. I attempted to draw x, y, z, and I'm just bad at drawing. All right, x, y, z. So we got these two. We set these two predicates up beforehand. And then we're just putting them. So things to check are things like scope. So for example, if I say g, x, y, z, and this, this three place predicate isn't under the scope of this universal, then what I've said is gobbledygook. What I said doesn't make any sense. So every time you use a variable, it's got to be under the scope of the quantifier that, that it's bound to. I think I did that. Yeah. So. To check these kind of questions, the thing to do is to read it out to yourself. Read it out in logic ease and see if it makes sense. So for all things such that they're boys, there exists something such that it's a dog, and there exists something such that it's a treat, and the dog likes the boy, and the dog gives the boy gives a treat to the dog. The boy likes the dog. Sorry, yes, the boy likes the hopefully the boy likes the dog and the dog likes the boy because the boy's giving him treats. But yeah, that's what that's what I meant to say. Sorry, that's what I meant to say that the boy likes the dog. The only thing I'm unsure about here is whether we need to say if the boy likes the dog, then he gives him a treat. That's that might be a better reading of this. So what I've got here is for every boy, there's some dog that they like that they gave a treat to. Um, we might want to say, for every boy, gave a treat to some dog he likes. No, that's OK. No, what we've got here is good. Yeah. It doesn't say, for every boy, they gave a dog to a treat. They gave a dog a treat if they like them, but rather that there exists a dog that they liked. Yeah. I think that would be the same. So the question is, if we had the following, would it be would it be the same? So there exists something such that dz and l x z, and there exists a y such that uh, g x y z. I believe that's the same. Um, the z and the x are still bound to the appropriate quantifiers. Uh, and we haven't done anything because that generic specific stuff was about embedding existentials in universals or universals in existentials. If you just have a series of existentials, then they, there's no problem with having them like either inside or outside. So I think that I think that amounts to the same thing. Yeah. If you did it that way, where would you the treat. The treat. Uh. Well. Oh yeah, so there exists a y. So I sorry, I should have said, yeah, I forgot one. I forgot one thing here. So there exists something such that uh, it's a treat, and then g x y z. Yeah, that's how it should have been. Sorry about that. Yeah. Good. Reasonably happy with that. You don't have to be thrilled. 
So long as it's clear what the question, the, so the point of today is really just to get you clear on the structure of the question, so you can read the question appropriately and you're not gonna be surprised by the format or anything like that. Yeah? Okay, good, let's move on. I think the symbolization stuff should be pretty familiar by now. Good. And then we're gonna do the following type of question. So here's the prompt that you're gonna see on your exam. The following sentences are ambiguous. Write out two good symbolizations of them using the symbolization schemes provided. So that's what we're going to do next. There's going to be two of these. They're worth four points each. Uh, and did I? Can't remember if I. No, I forgot to put a slide for this. OK, I'm going to witness this real time. OK. I assume you want to do this. We're going to run out of stuff to do if we don't. Or do you want to do this, or is it fairly straightforward what I'm asking? It might be more priority to look at ex invalidities and expansions. OK, OK. The point of those questions are just, are literally just, you just write out two symbolizations. And you recall, I'm sure, I mean, I'll just talk really briefly about this. You recall that the thing about ambiguous sentences, the kind of ambiguity I'm going to give you is where it's a scope ambiguity where it's unclear whether the existential takes wide scope or the universal takes wide scope. So you can fool some of the people all of the time. What are two, just come up, let's just work through the, the two possible linguistic readings of this and I'll leave the symbolization up to you. So, yeah. Good. So there exists at least one person that, for all of the times, you can fool them. And? And the second one would be, uh, for all times, there is some person. Good. Good. So there's a, there's a, there, there, for all times whatsoever, there exists at least one person that you can fool. So it's either the time takes wide scope, for all time takes wide scope, or there exists some people takes wide scope. And you just symbolize the sentence those two ways. And then you get four points, and you feel good about yourself and your life, and you're, you're, you're moving on. Yeah? OK. Good. So here's the ones that you haven't seen on a test before. This is like mildly, well, I mean, this is kind of more of the point of what are, we're doing today, so that you see exactly what the question is going to look like. So invalidities. I think I gave you three of these things, two single place, one multi-place. Uh, Here's exactly what the question is going to look like. Provide a model which shows that the following arguments are invalid. And then I'll give you an argument, and you'll, I'll give you the, the space to write down your UD your, and your predicates. And if there's a name, a space to write down the name. And your job is just like you write the little curly brackets and what goes in these things, and then close the curly brackets, and that's your answer. So you're just writing stuff after this. That's the answer to this question. OK? So we'll do, let's do this example. Unless there's any questions about the format or what, what I'm looking for in terms of an answer. Okay, okay, so. Right. So, uh, on the page you'll have UD and F, a space for F and a space for G, okay. And what you're going to do is open up yourself a curly bracket for each of them, and then just tell me what goes in the brackets. Now, I haven't told you the size of the universe of discourse yet. For the invalidities, I haven't told you what, how big the universe of discourse is. You're going to have to work that out for yourself. Always start with at least, uh, again, I, I said as, as a rule, you've got to have at least one object in your universe of discourse. So start with at least one object, and then work through. So uh, let's see. So we need to make the premise true and the conclusion false. This premise is currently trivially true, right? The premise is true because uh, nothing falls under the f predicate. If you haven't written the object under the predicate, then it's false of it. So fx is currently false because I didn't write anything under it. So if I plug 0 in for x, it comes out as false that 0 has the f property. So fx is false and gx is false by default. So premise one, the only premise, 
is currently true. Ray. OK, now we need to make the conclusion false. So there exists some, so if there exists something that doesn't have the F property, then there exists something with the G property. OK. So to make a conditional false, of course, you need to make the antecedent true and the consequent false. That's the only conditions under which a conditional is true, right? So currently, there exists something that doesn't have the F property. Yes, good. Zero does not have the F property. OK. Now, does there exist something, does that same thing have the G property? Well, no, it doesn't have the G property. OK. So what's tempting here is to just put zero in here and say, uh, look, now zero doesn't have, there exists something that doesn't have the F property, zero. Uh, oh, no, wait. No, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. So we need to make it false that there exists something with the G press. Currently, there's something that doesn't have the F property, and we need to make it false. We need to say it doesn't exist. This is why I write this F here, because I always try to make the, con the... So we need to make it true that there doesn't exist something with the G property. Well, there doesn't exist anything with the G property, so we're done. We just close these brackets. I believe I gave you questions where you're not allowed to just do, well, I, this won't be a valid answer. I believe I gave you questions where you have to add at least something to the predicates. I, I don't, don't, I'm not going to swear to that, but so check this, check to see whether you don't have to do anything, but hopefully, hopefully I gave you questions where you have to do more work than we just did. Um, right. Uh, so these are going to be kind of a pain in the butt for us to mark because there's lots of answers to these questions. There's lots of equally good answers to these questions. So if you didn't get this as an answer, if you put some stuff in the predicates that nonetheless made the antecedent true and the consequent false of the, of the conclusion and the premise is true, then you get full marks. So we're going to have to work through your different answers and figure out whether they're right or not. But hopefully the TAs will be vigilant and get it right. OK? So this is my answer. So all of this stuff is not my answer to this question. None of this stuff is involved. Just this stuff is the answer to this question. That's all we're going to be looking at on these, just the stuff that you put in curly brackets after those letters. Yeah? OK? Questions about this stuff? OK. It's going to be a short class, I think. OK. So that's the invalidities question. There are three of them, uh, worth two points apiece. I think two single place, one multi-place. And then we're going to do some expansions. So you'll see the following prompt. Provide expansions of the following arguments, as well as a model which shows they are invalid. So you're going to do the expansion, and then you're going to use the expansion to do the invalidity, just like we were doing last class. So what you'll see is going to look like this. There'll be an argument. I'm going to tell you what the universe of discourse is. For the expansions, I'm going to tell you ahead of time what the universe of discourse is. OK? Uh, and then there'll be, uh, for every predicate in the argument, there'll be an open curly bracket or a, a thing that you're going to fill in. And then you're going to have a line with a big gap that says expansion of premise one. And you're going to write the expansion of premise one. And then expansion of premise two, if there's a premise two. I'm going to write the expansion of premise two, and then expansion of conclusion. So you're going to do all of that. You're going to do all of the expansions, and then you're going to use those to fill in whatever goes in the F predicate. OK? So let's do this example. OK. So, uh, right. Oops. So again, what you're going to see is uh, a universe of discourse already filled in for you, zero and one, and you're going to see a, a space for the predicate, and then 
uh, expansion premise one. And although the, the line that says expansion of premise one comes after the place where you fill in the invalidity, you're probably going to do this first. Unless you just see the answer, oh, that would be fine. But for most of us mortals, we're going to have to do the expansion to figure out whether this is good or not. OK. So what I'd like you to do is, I mean, you're, the recommended way of dealing with these expansions is to do them in steps. So you won't get marks for all of the steps. Again, if you can just do it in your head, that's fine. You only get marks for the, like, the final expansion, which I'd like you to put a box around to show me that you know which part is the final expansion. So uh, let's do this expansion. So for all x, there exists a y such that this thing. OK, good. Should be one more bracket there. So peel off the universal. And when we expand a universal, that's a series of conjunctions. So we're going to say there exists a y such that f 0 y or f y 0. And all of that. And there exists a y such that f 1 y or f y1. Good. So that's first step. That's not yet my answer. That's just the first step in doing the expansion. We still have to expand those existentials. So we're going to expand those existentials now. Uh, remembering that, of course, this is still going to be once I've expanded. So the, this is a sentence, right? This is a sentence, and this is a sentence. And the whole combination of them, the major connective is this conjunction. After you're done expanding the existentials, this is still going to be the major connective. This is still, the whole thing when we're done is still going to be a conjunction. It's just going to be a conjunction amongst things that don't have these existentials in anymore. So let's expand the existentials. Expanding existentials turns the sentence into a series of disjunctions. So we're going to have F00 or F00. Uh, or F01 or F10. And the whole thing conjoined with, so that's the expansion of this one. Now we'll do the expansion of this one. F10. Or F01 or F11 or F11. <laughs> okay. Right. Three brackets. Uh, and it would be nice if you would draw a box around what you consider the final answer for each of these. Yeah? so that we know which parts of it we're going to be marking. Because this thing, this thing is not yet an expansion of premise one. It's just a, a step that I wrote down to help myself get to the expansion of premise one. OK, now let's do expansion of the conclusion. So for all x, there exists a y such that f x y. So expanding the universal first, we say there exists a y such that, uh, oh, I don't need that bracket, f 0 y. And there exists a y such that f 1 y. And then we'll expand these existentials to con disjunctions. So f 0 0 or f 0 1, that whole thing, and uh, f 1 0, sorry, yeah, f 1 0 or f 1 1. OK, so there is our expansion of the conclusion. OK. Good. Now, we just have to figure out a way of making the premise true while the conclusion is false by filling in stuff that goes under this f predicate. Um, 
Again, uh, the, the way that I showed you last time and the way that I find it easy to do this is just to list out all of the possibilities. I'm just going to list out all of the possibilities. From, I'll do it up here. So here are the possibilities for the F predicate. F00, F01, F10, and F11. So those are all of the possible things that we can put. Because this is a nice one because we only have one predicate to fill in. It's just one two-place predicate. So we're going to either put true or false under each of these and figure out a way to make this whole thing true and this whole thing false. OK. So uh, to make this whole thing true, because the major connective is a conjunction, and if you're if you've lost track, I know this is a mess to look at. If you've lost track, I'll just remind you, you can figure out what the major connective of any of these are going to be by looking at what the most major operator is. So this is, an, this is a universal. This is an existential embedded inside a universal. So the major connective is going to be a conjunction. This is also an existential embedded inside a universal. So the major connective is going to be a conjunction. So for both of these, this conjunction is the major connective. Yay. OK. So to make a conjunction true, we have to make both of these true. And to make both of these true, well, we just have to make one of these true, either f0, 0, or f1, f0, 1, or f1, 0. And we have to make at least one of these true. So it's pretty easy to make this true, because it's just a series of conjunctions. So I'm going to use the guess and check method and literally just put in uh, true for f0, 0. So f0, 0, actually, if I make, if I make f1, 0 true, then I've made both of these true. So f1, 0 makes this true, which makes this disjunction true, which makes this whole disjunction true. So good. And furthermore, f1, 0 makes this, disjunc this true, which makes this disjunction true, which makes this whole thing true. And since the first line is true and the second line is true, the whole sentence comes out as true. OK, good. So we've made the premise of this argument true. Now we just have to make the conclusion false. OK, so what would make this conclusion false? It would be false if both of these are false. So we need both of these things to be false. Right. And that means that, uh, oh, all four of these have to be false. All four of these have to be false, don't they? Only one side has to be false. That's good. I didn't, because it's got all possibilities in there, it would be disastrous if all four of them had to be false. OK, so only one side of the conjunction has to be false for the whole thing to be false. Which side shall we make it? Well, we've already made this true, which makes this whole thing true. So that's probably, unless we want to go and undo the work that we did to make the premise false, or premise true, we probably don't want to deal with this side. So let's try this side. Well. F0, 0, 0 is currently false, and F0, 1 is currently false. So good. We made the conclusion false. So here is the answer. Here's me right. So this is not really the answer. This is me doing like notes and stuff. Here's me giving the actual answer. The ordered pair of 1 and 0. Close brackets. Yeah? OK, that was the expansion. So the, the parts that there are the actual answer are this part, and then this stuff in this box, and the stuff in this box. It might take a bunch of note making. I will try to remember to bring like note paper for you in case you need extra paper to like make. Because these things involve guessing and checking, right? They involve some like trying stuff and seeing if it works and going back and trying other stuff. So uh, we want to make it really clear which bits are your actual answer. Uh, whatever you write after the predicate will be your, af your actual answer. And if you would put a box around what you consider the final expansion, that'll be your answer as well. OK? OK. Any questions about this stuff? Good? OK, then we're just about done. We're just about done. So yeah, your expansions will look like this. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, 
Sorry, can you what? Oh, you mean right now? Uh, we could, but that's how I solve multiplace invalidities. Well, uh, not necessarily, but that's how I do it. So we could, uh, let me see, let me see if I got an example we could try. Um, okay, here's one. Like, so this is why I do the expansions, because I don't know how to, like, it's hard to, like, think through this stuff. We can, I don't know if I could do it. To be honest, I don't know if I could do it. Um, and logic 2010 is relatively easy because you can just fiddle around and guess and check and like ask it whether you got the right answer. Uh, if doing this in a test environment, I do the like I do the expansion so that I can solve a multiplace invalidity. So there's one multiplace invalidity where I'm not asking you to do the expansion, uh, but feel free to do one anyway if it helps you solve it. It helps me to solve it. Like I don't know how I would tackle that without having done the expansion. Having done the expansion, it, you can see it's a relatively mechanical, like, okay, now I make this conjunction true and that disjunction false. And like, you just chug through kind of old sentential logic skills to get that solved. But with, I don't, I don't know how I would, I don't have the, I don't have the brain power to just see the answer to something like that. So, so yeah, uh, there's only one invalidity where I'm, it's multiplace and I'm not asking you to do the expansion. Uh, if you can solve those, play around. I mean, there's a bunch of invalidities on Logic 2010 that you can play with. If you can solve them without doing the expansion, that you're a smarter person than I am. If you can't, just do the expansion. Just do it for yourself, and it really helps. OK? Yeah? Do you mind name letters? Good, yeah. So name letters just get assigned to something. So suppose there was a name letter in this thing. Suppose that I had. Uh, like an A and a B or something like that. You just say whether they are zero or one or whatever. So, sorry, that was a mess. Uh, yeah, if you've got an A and a B in there, you assign them to one object. And that's true in single place and multiplace. There's no multiplace names. Names always apply to just one object. So if instead of saying, so suppose that this had been instead of uh, F, X, Y, it had said F, uh, A, Y, or F, sorry, even better, F, A, B, fab. Uh, then you'd have to fill in whether you think A should be 0 and B should be 1 or whatever. So you'll assign an object to the name. And then in the rest of your, so this now says, so this F, 1, 0 is equivalent to uh, F B A. So that equals F one zero. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Good. Right. And finally, I didn't bring you an example of a derivation, I'm sorry. Um, you guys absolutely rocked the derivations on test two, so now I'm going to just leave you to your own devices because I'm worried. Uh, I will tell you about the derivations that you'll be doing. So there's one basic, rule, basic rules derivation and three derived rules derivation, all of them in multi-place predicate logic. Uh, so just to review the rules for these things, in basic rules, you cannot use CDJ, De Morgan's, negation of conditional, negation of biconditional, separation of cases, quantifier negation, or alphabetic variance. So those are not allowed in basic rules. What you can use are these basic rules. And universal derivations are OK in basic rules. You are allowed to use universal derivations in basic rules. It's not a rule. It's a derivation type. But we're going to say, yes, you can use UD in a basic rules derivation. Derived rules derivations, of course, you could just use all the rules. So hopefully that's reasonably clear. Any questions about the derivations? No? I'm surprised to see that that's the one that people seem to have had the least trouble with. I find them incredibly difficult. Huh. OK. Yeah?
That's right. There's no short answer. There's no explain the following concept. There's no, there's no, just exactly the questions that I showed you, just symbolization, invalidities, expansions, and derivations. There's no like define the following or whatever. There's no multiple choice. There's no essay question. There's no reflection portion of this. Uh, just, just exactly what I showed you is are, are the only things on the exam. Uh, there are a couple of invalidities in single place, uh, but everything else is multi-place. Yeah. And I did that because it's a cumulative exam in some sense, because all of the skills that you've learned in every previous section are involved in doing the multi-place stuff. So it kind of all comes together at this point. Yeah. Uh, so what will be written out is the ones that you are allowed to use. So you have a li you'll have the middle line there, a list of available rules, and then in the multi-place or in the in the uh, all rules, you'll get a list of the CDJ, DM, NC, NV. Just like in the tests. Yeah. Um, like. I don't want to swear that you, it is absolutely not necessary. I find it very unlikely that you'll need it. Uh, I, it's not that helpful of a rule, to be honest, unless, except in very weird circumstances, it's not that helpful of a rule, but you should know how to use it. I'm not, I am not guaranteeing you that it's not on the exam. That's, that's a double negation, but it, it is possible. There exists some possible world in which that's, that you need to know AV on the exam. So don't, think that it's unnecessary. I just think it's unlike if you're prioritizing your life, if you're like, I haven't eaten in two days and I haven't slept in four and I have to figure something out, just don't learn AV. That's in those circumstances, don't worry about it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, all of the all of the derivations are multi place. Sure. So generic is universal and specific is existential, right? No. No. So the universals are always universals. So if you say for all, it doesn't matter what the scope is. It's always for all. Uh, it's whether the existential is inside a universal, then it's ger generic. And if the existential is outside, then it's specific. You're saying there is some specific person, Bob, who you can fool all the time, or if it's inside, you're saying there's at least one person who you can fool. Okay. So can you say for all time there exists some generic person you can fool? Yeah. And for some specific person, he or she can be fooled all of the time? Exactly. Okay. You got it. All right. Well, I think that's it. Good luck on the exam. All right. Bye.